I'm talking today with Chris Judge, who is an archaeologist with the USC Lancaster Native American Studies Center. And I don't really know what an archaeologist is. <laughs> Well, archaeologists study past cultures, and we do it through the material remains and traces of the past. So it's everything from artifacts, things made and used by humans that are durable, made of stone, made of pottery, that survive in the ground. Uh, Ecofacts, things people take out of nature and use but don't alter, like uh, shells that they eat for, uh, you know, oysters or mussel shells, and they, they get, throw them in a pile. We can't tell the difference between one that just rotted and one that's been used for food. Uh, plant remains, I think you talked to Gail Wagner on a previous show. Uh, carbonized and burned lasts a long time, and we can look at those for diet. Uh, and then features, you know, fire pits, storage pits, grave pits, any hole in the ground, we can find it. And if those have artifacts, ecofacts in them, that's the kind of thing that we can use to uh, kind of recreate the behavior in the past, human behavior. It's not just about the artifacts, it's about the people that made and used them. And in South Carolina, we feel like indigenous people have been here how long? Probably since about 16,000 years ago in the last ice age. Oh, goodness. Yeah. And were they highly mobile? Highly mobile. They're following herd animals like mastodon and um, uh, mammoth who move to where the rainfall and the grass is. And so they have to be ready to pick up and go. So they have a lightweight toolkit. It's hard to find where they've been because they would build a very lightweight house uh, and then move on. And there's probably no evidence of those from the ice age. So we rely on stone tools mainly for those early periods to learn about people. And Later on, I'm going to get you to explain how we know about some of these non-durable objects. But first, sure. let's just start with um, how did they get something to eat? Yeah, well, I'm going to call this forest to table. Uh, the first thing that they would use is something called an atlatl. And the atlatl is usually about two feet long. Up in my right hand, we've got an antler handle. Mm -hmm. uh, down at the bottom is an antler hook. And then there's a counterbalance weight. And then the shaft is made out of cane. And then it's got some, uh, some buckskin kind of bindings. And what this did, Amanda, was it was used to propel a spear. And so everybody thinks that the Native Americans had the bow and arrow all through time. You show a bow to a kid, it's a bow and arrow. You show an arrow to a kid, it's a bow and arrow. But they use something like this. And it's got turkey feather fletching. It's got a point out at this end. And by pushing from the way back, it gives you greater distance, velocity, and accuracy in throwing a spear as opposed to where a javelin uh, thrower would hold it here. And so you just, ca it's like casting a fishing rod, you throw it, and uh, this would have been how they would have gone after deer and other game at the end, after the ice age when the large animals that you could walk up and stab And you said away. this gave it a little more stability so that it didn't. If you're, if you're deer hunting, you have to be perfectly still. So if you don't have a weight back there, you're trying to counterbalance the spear oh, in front of you and it allows you to stand still. Okay. Uh, deer are very skittish and they can see, hear, and smell you. And then um, that one has a point. This one has a wooden point on it, something that I use for demonstrations, and I don't want it to break, but yes. they would be stone-tipped. Uh, we know that they used antler and bone, and uh, you know this one here is a, is a spear point uh, used out of stone. They would put these onto small handles, oh. socket them into the spear, and then when you're done, oh. it's a knife for butchering, but it does double duty as a... Um, as you uh, said, lightweight toolkits. Right, it's gotta, yeah. you gotta be able to carry everything yeah. with you. Yeah. How did they make these, and did it depend on what was available, what type of stone was available? You have available? to get crypto-crystalline rocks. So down in Allendale along the Savannah River, it's, it's chert. It's a rock that forms in marine sediment. Uh, it's glass-like. Over in the PD, it's rhyolite. It's a metavolcanic rock from the Uwari Mountains mainly. Uh, that uh, they're brittle and you can chip them. And it's, two, it's a two-step process of, one is percussion flake and you're using a soft hammer or a hard hammer like a rock to chip. But before, I just want to say, I mean, you make it sound so simple, but this was a complex creation. This one is itself. a scrape. This is a scraping tool for working hides. Yes. So once, you, once you've killed the deer and you're cooking it for dinner, you want to tan that hide. You got to scrape out, scrape it clean of all the little particles that are inside there. Okay. And so this is a, a uniface that's worked on one angle right. and used almost like a carpenter uses a draw knife or a plane to scrape. All right. And um, so it can be used to work leather, it can also be used to work wood. Okay. But I'm just using this as an example of a percussion okay. billet okay. or a, uh, a stone to do that. So you're percussing or pressure is the other one. When you resharpen and get a nice edge, 
you're taking an antler tine and a handle that's set up in your arm here, and then pushing down and up to produce little, like serrated edge like a steak knife. Oh, Because right. that's what you're gonna do with sure. it. You're gonna cut meat, right? Uh -huh. And so the pressure fraking allows you to put a durable edge on there. These are sharper than and then, scalpels. And then this, you said since you this had to do this it for your, so long. You this kind of locks it in yeah. your hand and gives you more control more and pressure. Leverage. Okay. Yeah. Gosh, that's a lot of work, isn't it, all the time? Well, yeah. it probably Did worked you? really well for people that really knew how to do it. Yes. I'm an amateur. So, were people specialists sometimes? You know, you, you got to wonder if they were kind of like Renaissance folks that did everything or if there were specialists. Based on humans that I know in the present, I would think pe some people were really good at it. Uh -huh. And maybe you traded them. Say, I don't, I'm not good at it. Give me a couple of those. I'll trade something for it. But probably everybody had a rudimentary understanding of how to do it. If you um, wanted to cook meat, and I guess, some, I mean, if it was absolutely fresh, you could eat some of it. Right. Then. But if eventually you'd want to cook you it. You want to cook meat, then you need a fire. And uh, you've always heard of rubbing two sticks together, right? Yeah. And that, it's probably a little more complicated than that involving the bow. And the bow is around longer before they use it as the bow and arrow. Um, musical instrument, right? The precursor of the piano and the guitar. So did these people use it to make those kind of tones sometimes? Do we they think? may have. That. In Africa, they use a very similar one, one string instrument like this. So probably that was yeah. universal. Could be. Yeah. And then, um, but what they do to make fire is they rub two sticks together, but they do it in a, in a way that's far more efficient. So you wrap your spindle around your, your, your cordage, and then you stick this down into the hole. And this was something made specifically this for a, this. This is called person. a fireboard. You've right. got a little slot in the front. And you can see where it's been turned yes. into charcoal from the pressure. And then you don't, want, you don't want friction up here, so you put a little oil off your skin on there. And you don't want to drill a hole in your hand. Oh. And so this just goes back and forth like this. And eventually a cone of sawdust builds up on the bottom there, turns into an ember. And then the little slot allows you to take some really dry Ooh. inner bark and mulberry tree and drop that ember in there and then blow on it and you got your fire. Mm -hmm. So you've hunted and gotten some meat, you've got your fire, and now you want to cook. Yes. Well, they're going to use the marshmallow hot dog technique, put it on a stick and hold it over the fire. But they probably also want to use containers. Uh, an early container is the bottle gourd. Which it, was here. Which was here. We cut it in half, cut, cut the top off of it. Uh, you've got a perfect uh, container. Now, it's not fire durable. You can't stick it in the fire. No. But what they did was they, they took quartz rocks, Quartz. Quartz pebbles like these, put them in the fire, heated them up, and then drop them into the water. Now what happens with quartz, it explodes, it heats the water, but it explodes and you get grits in your grits, it grinds teeth down. Oh my goodness. So at the coast they make... So this, so you said by the time people were in their late 20s or so, they really didn't the, have any teeth the, 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 They could have serious attrition to their teeth, yeah. Which is I mean, going to affect your life Yeah, just from just from the grinding, yeah. yeah. At the coast, they make clay balls. We call them fire clay objects. They just ball up some clay, poke holes in it so when it heats and cools, the expansion doesn't crack it, and heat these in the fire and drop them in the container. Well, that uh, was a big plus. Uh, yes. And then up in the upstate, we have soapstone. It occurs in a band from Stone Mountain, Georgia, to uh, the mall in Washington, D.C., and it comes through Spartanburg, Cherokee County, South Carolina. And they could, they could uh, quarry this. And what they did was they made a hole in it, because it's easy to drill, but it's a massive talc. It's very soft. You can yes. scratch it with your fingernail. Heat these up, drop it in the water, and it's, thermo it's resistant to that shock of hot to cold. Eventually, they... So it, would, it didn't fill up the, um, con the water with grit? No, was, no. Yeah. So, no. So, so it's, that was it, a it plus. solved that problem. Yeah. Eventually, they make the whole bowl out of it. Whoa. And... This is a replica, and uh, you know, but you could use this to cook fish. You could put a little bear grease in there and put a fish in, just stick that in the fire oh. and let it just cook real slowly. Um, eventually, they start to make uh, clay pots, and as they start to use really starchy seeds like maygrass, yes. uh, kinopodium, which Gail Wagner, which told Gail us Wagner all about, talked about yeah. in a previous program. Because we have to remember that the Three Sisters was way, way, way down the road. Yeah, more, yeah. far more recent. Yeah. Uh, but these little starchy seeds, it's like rice. You can't break into the bag of rice on the way home from the mm -hmm. grocery store and start snacking. It's got to be simmered. And so uh, uh, containers that could do that were required. And so we see the rise of, of pottery vessels. Now, uh, 
in doing some replicative work with this, uh, I worked with a guy named Keith Grenoble who makes pots and uses them and cooks in them. Yes. And I was thinking we were going to do an experiment. I thought we were just going to make a stew or a soup standing up like that. But what he did was he laid it like that, put the meat in there, and the fire's in the center, and he just rolls this around. So the meat is turning over. The heat is broadcasting into the pot. So you can use these in a lot of different ways. You can cook in them, you can store in them, you can eat from them. Uh, so they have uh, multi-functions. So these have been fired and are pretty resistant to having that slow these, exposure Yeah, these have, been, these have been cooked at probably uh, 1,400 Fahrenheit or greater. So they, they're, they're able to survive the fire. So this was important when people had a source of clay near them. Yeah, not every clay works, but they figured out where those sources were and, and made pottery. So where you are with the Catawba, apparently that became, was an incredible part of the they, they continue a tradition which we think is almost 5,000 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some of the oldest native pottery in South, here in South Carolina for the whole country. And when I read about it, it sounds like they still like to go to the same original They are going to the exact same spot for, for hundreds of years, mm -hmm. if not longer. Because they know the properties of the clay that comes from those they, they, they have a clay that they really feel is, is yeah. far superior to all other okay. clays. And uh, another, another thing that I brought with me today is a, a nutting stone. Um, so again, it's soapstone. They've got these little pits in it. Let's hold it up so they can see it a little bit better. Yeah, it's heavy. And then, so they, they take black walnuts and stick them all in the little holes. And then black put, walnuts are the dickens. Or acorns yeah. or hickories yeah. and then dump yeah. it out. So they're mass producing nut foods, which mm -hmm. are an important source of protein. Uh, predictable in the fall, you get them, you store them, you keep them dry. And, uh, Deer hunting is not as predictable, so that's a good good source of food that they can use. And, uh, and then, of course, um, once you get your food cooking, you got your fish cooking in here, and you got some may grass cooking in your pot over there. Uh, another thing that we know that the natives used was a beverage called Yopan or Cassina made from Ilex vomitoria. Yes. That in, in the 16th century, they observed Indians and their... Um, Drinking it in large quantities, quantities, regurgitating it to kind of get into a spiritual, like almost like fasting sort of a state, uh, as a as a ceremonial sort of a thing. Oh. And unlike our tea, they they, as I understand it, the the leaves are green. So, so they use the leaves, not the berries. The berries are poisonous. Yeah, oh, so you got to use the leaves. Okay. And you know they kind of break them open and kind of muddle them a little bit, and then uh, heat that up, and that makes a tea-like beverage. It has uh, some qualities of aspirin. It's got a little caffeine in it, uh, and it was a ceremonial beverage, but you could probably drop a hot rock in here and let that slow, slow, slow So that was cook. not done to get rid of worms or purgative. I mean, and that, the way it's, I mean, when nah, I was coming along, they used to, you know, worm children particularly every now and then. I never over. thought about that, but yeah. I guess it possibly. But, but, but it was really to, in the way that some people fast, yeah, the during friend, Lent and things like that, yes, during the Christian tradition yes. and other traditions. Yeah. So this, for them, was to empty themselves and prepare for right, perhaps right. for right. The yeah. French cartographer Jacques Lemoyne in 1562 draws, draw, makes drawings uh, of them, and they're sitting around in a circle. There's big pots and they're brewing it, and then they're using conch shell cups to drink that, and then in, in, in that image, several people are in the active process of removing it from their body. When the Europeans came, you said that the things that they brought made it so much easier to do many things that our peoples who had been here, the, the indigenous people, said, this is a lot easier. I can get a knife. I can yeah. get Yeah. Unfortunately, when Europeans came, Native Americans sort of assimilated to the mass-produced uh, materials. So we see stone arrow points. The Europeans arrived. They're breaking the Indians are breaking the bottle of wine bottles, snapping those into points. But very quickly, they all have the flintlock trade mm -hmm. gun. Mm -hmm. uh, very soon, buckskins go away, and they're wearing cloth. You have mm -hmm. Native men wearing silk stockings, and uh, they're, they're softer than the mm -hmm. tanned hides mm -hmm. that they're accustomed mm -hmm. to wearing. Shell beads are replaced by glass beads. Uh, stone knives are replaced by iron. You told me a fascinating story about how it was kind of unbelievably um, <laughs> circumstantial and serendipitous that we found out about these these objects that were that did not last. Yeah, you know, the, the fire kit that I showed is entirely of organic okay. items, and so it rots away. But uh, uh, in in the early uh, 20th century, there was an Indian in California who's a Yanni, and his name was Ishi, and last of his people, um, 
he was distraught, decided he would walk to the end of the world and throw, him, throw himself off. The cattle herders had moved in and were exterminating his, his community. Uh, and they caught him and they, they threw him in jail. And Al Krober, who was at the Lowy Museum at the University of California, Berkeley, found out about it, went up there and got him. And then in the summers, they would live off the land. So he showed Krober how you make fire with the bow drill and how you make a bow and how you make a harpoon and how you trap and, and snare small game. And so while in evolution, there are no links to the past, there's no links because it's a tree, uh, Ishii is kind of our link to the past for some of these kind of things. We call this experimental archeology. span If we try to do some of these things, we, we bridge the gap between the static archeological record, I, things that just don't tell us much, but the dynamic behavior that yes. produces all of this. And of course, there's always the uh, possibility that we're wrong, but it helps, it helps us uh, engage in the past and kind of come up with some theories that are viable. Y'all have a, um, wonderful exhibits that change pretty frequently up there, and then there's some things that are always there. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about the Native yeah. American Yeah, everything's Center. changing. We have, we have exhibits, uh, our, our curator rotates them through very frequently, and uh, we are, we're, we're free Tuesday through Saturday to come up and come see Native American exhibits. Sometimes it's this sort of thing. Uh, a lot of what we do is, uh, rather than thinking about natives in the past, we think about them in the contemporary moment. And so we've, we've got exhibits on the different tribes coming in for a year where you can kind of uh, look at those. And, uh, uh, and art, ma mainly modern Native American art uh, tied to either the Southeast or specifically South Carolina. Because um, people's culture isn't static, it changes. No, it changes all the time, as you know. Like how often did your parents say, we didn't do it like that when I was yeah, a kid, yeah. and it's true. And so we're seeing that there. Well, I want to thank yeah. you so much for sharing this I appreciate absolutely it. fascinating yeah. information. Yeah, thanks for having me on.